Turn with me to the ninth chapter of Luke, if you're not already there. Ninth chapter of Luke, as we're making our way through this great gospel. Some of you may remember, I'm guessing one or two, probably no more, uh, a, a man named Richie Hebner. I'd ask for hands, but I'm not sure I'd get any. I uh, might get one or two. Richie Hebner played third base for the Pirates and the Phillies in the 70s and 80s. He's a pretty good ball player, but he had a very interesting, you know, off-season career. He was a grave digger off-season, and he was quite proud of it. He once said, I've been doing this for 10 years. He said, I'm really good at it. In 10 years, nobody has ever dug out of one of my graves yet. <laughs> I thought that was kind of impressive, especially in light of the fact that I wish I could say the same thing about my life. See, when we accept Christ as Savior, the Bible teaches that we become a new creation on the inside. And in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, here's what it says about the old creature, the old me. It says, we know that our old self was crucified with him. Now that ought to bring up a big question in your mind. It does in mine. The question would be, you know, if, if I'm a new me now as a believer and the old me was crucified with Christ, why is it he keeps kicking the dirt off of himself and coming back to life? How does that happen? Do you have the same issue? If you're honest, you know you have the same issue. Paul says in Romans 7, 19, he had the same issue. He says, for I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. What he's saying is my old self keeps kicking out of the grave. Now, how is it this goes on? If the old me is dead, why does this happen? Well, Paul answers that question as well. But in order to understand the answer, we have to understand one thing about how the Bible looks at death. <coughs> death in the Bible is not a cessation of existence. In fact, death in real life is not a cessation of existence. Death always means separation. Death is a separation of something. Physical death, you don't cease to exist, beloved. In physical death, your body and spirit, soul, the inside of you are separated, but it's not a ceasing to exist. Spiritual death is the separation of a person from God. And so the death that's being talked about here is that the old man doesn't cease to exist, but we're no longer tied at the hip, if I can put it that way. This is no longer my definition. This is no longer my identity. It doesn't cease to exist, but I'm no longer enslaved to my old self. However, it's very possible for me to give control back to him at any given time. The rest of the verse that I just quoted in Romans 6, 6 goes like this. It says, we know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin, it's the old self, might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That's Paul's answer to the problem. Death to self doesn't mean that the old self ceases to exist. It simply means that we're no longer obligated to it. We're no longer slaves to it. It was all we could do before. Before we come to faith in Christ, all we can do is obey the dictates of the old person. Now, we're separated from it in the sense that we don't have to do that. We don't have to be slaves to it, but we can. What that means is, now listen carefully because you will relate to this, that means that for a believer, there is a war going on inside all the time. Always a war going on. Always the new self wanting to do what's right, pointing toward the direction of Christ, 
Christ living in me, the old self saying, no, 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 the old ways were better, you need to go there. Our old self, our flesh, as it's also called in the Bible, wars against our new self. Both of them vying to get our will to do what they want. It's another passage of scripture that talks about this in more detail. You may want to study sometime. It's in Galatians 5. And in verse 17 of that passage, here's what Paul says. He says, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. And so we are at war with the old self. And it turns out we're not very good grave diggers because he keeps kicking the dirt off and coming up, right? So what are we to do? Well, that brings us to the passage we're at this morning in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And we've camped on this because it's such a critical verse for a couple of weeks. Jesus has an answer. And if you remember, we're in this passage where we're talking about the fact that salvation, salvation that we have in Christ is a very costly thing. It costs God the Father, His own Son. It costs the Son a humiliating, devastating physical and spiritual death in order to take the penalty for our sins. And it will cost us, will cost us, And that's what verse 23 of Luke 9 is about. It tells us that there are three things that it costs us. First of all, we have to deny self. Secondly, take up our cross daily. And third, follow him. Now, the good news is, this will be the greatest transaction you ever made. But it's costly. Because there's a piece of you that doesn't want to do this. The old self doesn't want this to happen. But it's so critical. So we looked last week at the first part of this. What must I do? I must first of all deny self. We saw that that means that it's it's a point in time action. The original language there, it says this is something that, that happens once and for all in our lives. Once and for all, at some point, our heart reaches out to God. We become repentant of our sins. We see that we stand before God as condemned and we, see, and we throw ourselves in the mercy of God. And when we do that, an unseen and an unfelt miracle takes place inside of us. God makes us a new creation. But here's the part we have to know now today. That's not the end of it. That's not the end of it. That's just the beginning. The commitment is just the beginning for in order to be truly saved is to be truly changed. Let me give you the easiest illustration I can of this. The Bible uses it. It's just like marriage. When two people stand up to be married, how long does it take them to get married? About as long as it takes to say, I do, right? That's it. It's a once for all commitment. But when they leave the building, back to life as usual, living in two separate places, going two separate directions, Of course not. Life changes immediately when you've made that commitment. And that's the way it is, beloved, when we come to Christ. We can't be the same person that we are before. We have a whole new identity, and it changes everything. And so so, so Jesus comes to the next item that he says constitutes true, being truly saved, and that is that we must take up our cross daily. Take up our cross daily. Now the word take up there is another word, the tense of which in the Greek is a a point in time action. In other words, this happens one time. But this one time happens on a daily basis. And by that it means more or less throughout the day or any time that it needs to happen. Jesus' followers are those who must take up their cross daily. Why? Why? Because once I've accepted Christ, the battle begins in earnest. The war is on inside of me. And in order to prevent the old man from raising up out of his grave and becoming the the deciding force in my life, I have to join with Christ in this 
battle. The battle, you know, if, 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 if you, if you kind of had a battle coming to Christ, and some of you did, it's nothing compared to the battle that happens afterwards. Don't be surprised. This is the normal Christian life have the spiritual warfare going on inside of us. The old self and the new self now are at war. Followers of Christ will feel this on a daily basis. No. So what does it mean? Well, first of all, I want you to look at what it does not mean. Really simple, but you need to kind of get this in mind because we misuse this phrase all the time. It does not mean life's hardships. It doesn't mean life's hardships. We often talk, to, talk about adversities as being our cross to bear. Ever hear that? Uh, it's an old common old phrase, right? And oftentimes we talk about that in terms of uh, perhaps a boss we don't like, perhaps the old car that doesn't work very well anymore and it breaks down more than it's not, or perhaps it's a, you know, a mother-in-law or some other relative that you don't care for, or the arthritis that's now plaguing you. We, we, use, we use this term, my cross is my cross to bear of all those kinds of things. And there's no question that those are tough things. Those are circumstances that come into our life. They're curveballs that life throws at us. I'm tempted to say they're, you know, they're kind of like a Clayton Kershaw curveball, but I'm sure you guys don't want to hear that, right? Uh, after the last couple of games, Kershaw's pitched against the poor Rockies, but uh, they did win yesterday, as somebody pointed out. So good news. It's, but, but life gives us these things. But these are, this is not our cross to bear. The cross to bear is something different. So what does it mean? What does it mean to take up your cross daily and follow Christ? Well, to the people to whom Jesus addressed this comment, they would have had a very vivid picture of what taking up your cross meant. They knew that crucifixion was the most humiliating and most painful type of execution known to mankind. I mean, it had, been, it had been accepted and it had been refined by the Romans to the point where it was excruciating to go through. And they used it only on the worst kinds of criminals. You know, foreigners, people that weren't Romans, enemies of the state, treasonous people. The worst kind of murders and so on might be assigned to crucifixion. Being condemned to crucifixion, were made to take up their cross. Usually this meant that they were beaten first, usually, you know, kind of up to 39 times with these terrible whips that they had in those days. He would be, be beaten and then he would be made to carry the cross beam of his cross to his final place of execution. Anyone who was carrying his cross, anyone who had taken up his cross, beloved, was on a one-way journey. He wasn't coming back. This was the utmost in denial of self. This person was no longer, he, he was absolutely now doing the will of the state. He was no longer doing anything that he wanted to do. This is what it means to take up your cross. He was very dead to self. He was doing only what someone else wanted him, even though he was at the moment still walking. Now, Jesus is saying to his followers, that's where I want you to go. Obviously not physically, but spiritually. You need to take up your cross. You need to die to self. Crucifixion was very well known to these people. The Galileans, you know, that's, that, that northern section of Palestine was well known to be a hotbed of insurrections and activity against Rome. They were, the, the people who were particularly involved in this were called zealots. Some of you will remember that one of the apostles of Christ was called Simon the Zealot. That's because he had a politically active background and would have been one of those who had been active against Rome. Well, when Jesus was 11 years old, there was a man named Judas who was one of the zealots who had led a raid against a Roman armory in the city of Sepphoris, which was about two miles north of Nazareth. So it was right in the same neighborhood where Jesus was living. 
Of course, the Romans were absolutely apoplectic when that happened. They didn't just try to find out who did it. They went to the town of Sepphoris. They burned the town to the ground. They took everyone, everyone who lived there, sold them into slavery, and they took 2,000 people and crucified them along the road leading in and out of Sepphoris and then left them there for weeks and months while they rotted on the crosses. Jesus knew what crucifixion was about, absolutely. These people knew. When Jesus said, I want you to take up your cross and follow me, and I want you to, to that, that he was saying, I want you to die to self daily. The cross meant submission to a higher authority. It meant death to self. Jesus is saying, this is what it means to be truly saved. So we have to ask ourselves, have we been there? Is this who we are? Taking one's cross daily is to be in denial of personal agendas in favor of a divine agenda. Now, it's a much better agenda. The good news is we don't do all this just you know, for the sake of persecution and humiliation, all the rest of it, we get a far better deal over here by following the agenda that Christ has for a life than we ever will out of whatever our agenda is. In fact, he may even incorporate some of what we think our agenda is. But it definitely means we have to give control to him. It's submission to the kingdom of God instead of building the kingdom of Dave or, you know, Lisa or Patty or, Mike, or whoever it happens to be. You can see that this separates the pretenders from the contenders, right? Jesus meant for it to do that. He would have made a very poor modern day evangelist, to tell you the truth. He's not saying just, you know, hey, hey, just, just, just begging people to just come to Christ. He's emphasizing the price over the price. And we emphasize the price and don't even talk about the price. We're so anxious to get people in, and so was Jesus. But he knew that the cross has to come first, and if you're not willing to go there, you can't be truly saved. Jesus never told this any other way. We're going to see it time and time as we go through the book of Luke. This is what he always this is, what, this is the way he always presents it from the beginning. And so saved people, beloved, are involved in a daily bloodbath to see who's going to rule in our hearts. Is it going to be me or is it going to be Christ? How's it going to be today? We're not going to be perfect at this any more than the disciples were perfect at this. And sometimes they went through extended times when they were not following the commitment that, that they had made, but in our heart of hearts, there has to be that commitment. That battle must be going on. If we can just kind of sin willy-nilly and doesn't even matter and we don't really care, probably not saved. We need to be followers of Christ. We must take up our cross daily. And you know what? We can't... When in our heart, we're following ourselves instead of following Christ. Listen, there's prices to be paid for that too. It looks like the right way. But I guarantee you over time, we will pay a price physically, spiritually, emotionally, in our conscience, because we've made a commitment and we're not following through on it. S.D. Gordon, an old pastor, beginning of the 20th century, he wrote a book called Quiet Thoughts on Prayer. And in it, he said, here's one of the things he said. He said, in every heart there is a cross and a throne, and each one is occupied. This is a, this is a great way to look at who we are inside. He said, if Jesus is on the throne ruling, self is on the cross dying. But if self is being obeyed and so ruling, then it is on the throne. And self on the throne means that Jesus has been put on the cross. I think that's a great description of what it means when Jesus says, I want you to take up your cross daily. We need to be asking ourselves, okay, who, what is it today? Is it me on the cross today? Or is it Jesus? Has self escaped the grave? Is he establishing himself on the throne again? 
The Christian life is a one-time decision. We saw, as this was what was emphasized in all of my childhood, it is a one-time decision. But beloved, it's a one-time decision that results in a lifetime change. Or it's not real. No change, no salvation. We have a new identity in Christ if we've come to him. Jesus is saying this is what needs to be in your mind on a daily basis. This is what needs to be forefront. This is not what needs to be something that you're thinking about and consciously committing to. To take up your cross daily and to follow him. Most of you probably heard this story. It's made the rounds. But, you know, there's, there are two guys out hunting one day, right? Ted and Bill. And after they've been hunting for a while, I don't know, they're Ted's just didn't get breakfast that morning or what, but he, he just falls over in a dead faint. So Bill le- leans down and he, I, I see I lost my identity, speaking of identities. He leans down and he says, uh, Bill, Bill, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he, and he can't get any response. So he's got his phone, he dials 911 and he says, he says, you gotta help me, you gotta help me, my friend Bill. I think, I think he just dropped over dead, what should I do? You know, the calm voice on the phone says, well, listen, I can help you. I'm here to help. Don't panic. First, let's make sure that he's really dead. There's a pause. And then there's the sound of a gunshot. And then Bill comes back on the phone and says, okay, he's dead. Now what do I do? (laughs) What do we do next? It's a brutal joke, right? But listen, listen, beloved, that's a description of how brutal we must be with the old person. It's a daily daily process while we still live in this life to resubmit and to resubmit and to recommit to Christ on a daily basis. That's what he's saying. It doesn't just happen and now you're good to go. It's a daily process. What's the third thing then? If we have to take up my cross daily. The third thing is to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. What a, what a great thing this is. This is a present tense command, so that means the emphasis here is on the continuing, ongoing motion, action of following Christ. This is to be just who a Christian is. It's someone who is following Christ. If you had to give a definition of a Christian, who is it? It's someone who's following Christ. The word literally means to come up behind someone. The picture, the word picture is, y'all, we, we, all, played, we all played follow the leader when we were kids, right? Remember, remember that game? And when you got to be leader, of course, your, your kind of challenge was to try and do something that the people behind you couldn't do. But the objective was to imitate what the leader is doing. And in essence, that's all Jesus is urging us to do here. He's urging us to be like he is. He's urging us to follow the pattern of his life, to think as he thinks, to speak as he speaks, to act as he acts, to have the values that he has and incorporates into his life, to follow me. Now listen, This is absolutely the most unnatural thing in the world, right? It is. Because the natural thing is to follow me. The natural thing is to follow the dictates of my self-centered instincts. That's where we naturally tend. We seek our own ease, our own comfort, our own ambition, our own advancement, our own will. It's who we are. We, we, we may pattern ourselves after someone occasionally, but even when we do that, it's usually in order that we might somehow advance some objective that we have. But when Jesus says, follow me, we've reached a crossroad, right? And the question is, okay, today, this hour, the next minute, am I going to be on Self Street or am I going to be on Jesus Road going this direction? Which is it? Which is it going to be? Follow me. Jesus said it's a radical departure from all that is natural. Now, I want you to just kind of listen to this as I go through 
to, to make a point, something that I, that I think you can relate to, follow me as an invitation to join Jesus in a heartfelt, conscious prayer, which is where we find him at every major point in his life, prayer to understand and then to do the will of the Father. This is what Jesus said. When Jesus says, follow me, that's what he did every, I mean, it just it filled his mind, it filled his heart. You can see it in every aspect of his life. I think follow me is summarized, for example, in a passage like John 4, verse 34, where Jesus says, my food, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. What was it that sustained Jesus? What nurtured him spiritually? And what drove him even physically was what? To do the will of the Father. I mean, when, I know we were all seeking God's will when we were looking for a husband or wife, right? We were very anxious about it then. We were all seeking God's will when we were thinking about a career. But my question is, when was the last time you seriously were thinking, what is the will of God? What's the will of God about this issue? What's the will of God about whether I go to this gathering or not? What's the will of God about how I treat this action that I know is going to come up at work today? What's the will of God about how I do everything I do? Because you see, that's where Jesus was going all the time. Listen to this. John chapter 5, verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. Have you got there yet? I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It's pretty obvious, isn't it, that Jesus is actively rejecting the will of me in favor of the will of the Father. And now he's saying to us, follow me, follow me, follow me constantly. Keep on following me as I seek the will of the Father. We need to care more about his agenda than we do our own. Jesus says, I mean, th- this is a matter of eternal life and death, beloved. We, we miss this fact. Jesus says it this way in, in, in Matthew 7, 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, but the one who's committed his life to me. The one who prayed the prayer. It's not what he says. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, is is he preaching salvation by works? No, come next week. If you don't like that verse, don't come next week, because that's where we're going to be in Luke. But it's a great verse to remind us that we made a commitment, and now the proof of whether we really made the commitment is, are we following through on it? Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. Beloved, it's a good thing he prayed that because his will was, I don't want to do this. It's a heavy challenge and it's a costly challenge. Are you seeing that salvation wasn't as simple as maybe you thought? It's costly. Cost the Father, it cost the Son. Why would we ever think it wouldn't cost us? Jesus tells us to follow him is to suffer as he suffered. He says in John 15, verse 20, if they persecuted me, believe me, they will persecute you also. Don't be surprised, expect it. To follow Jesus, listen, is to, is to have a farewell party for our own ambitions, plans, expectations, and everything else. And whatever Jesus gives back to us, Great. But it's a commitment of the totality of our life and person to him. In the end, you can't lose, but you have to go there to have eternal life. And listen, let me really stress this point. It has to be a following of him that's not just out of a sense of duty. 
Because that is trying to earn your salvation. Listen, your salvation is given to you free and clear without any charge and without any merit that you can do. But if you belong to him and if you are a new creature, inside you there's going to be this desire to do the will of God. If you don't have that burning desire, if that doesn't wrestle with the old self, something's wrong. Something's drastically wrong. We have to do what the Lord wants because we love him, not because there's a gun to our head. It's very different to get married because there's a gun to your head, shotgun wedding, right, than there is to because you want to, because you love the other person. And this is what God's looking for. Follow me isn't about obeying because there's a loaded gun. You know, God gives us the command. I want you to love your enemies. Oh, right off the bat, we're in trouble, right? We love to hate our enemies. Isn't that true? I mean, we love to warm it around in our mind. And this person has done me wrong. And it just feels good to concentrate on that and to think about all the ways that I've been wronged and to think about how awful it is and maybe even to conjure up how can I get even? What can I do to put this person in their place? Love your enemies? If we do it, it tends to be grudgingly. And then it gets worse because he doesn't say just love your enemies, but he says, okay, but I also want you to pray for those who persecute you. (sighs) But beloved, here's where the Lord's going with this command, follow me. The command is to love God more than we hate our enemies. Do you see that? When you get that perspective right, it changes everything. But until you get there, it's not going to work. Listen, believe me, we were not lovely to God. We, We memorized the verse, right? For God loved us when we were yet sinners. God didn't love us because we were lovely. He loved us because he chose to love those who are absolutely unworthy. And he's asking us to follow in his footsteps with this. I want you to love me more than you hate your enemies. Follow me. I'm going to go to the cross for you. You're my enemy. I'm going to go to the cross for you. Because I love the Father more than I dislike the sin that's in your life. We have to love Jesus more than we hate our enemies. Most of us have that backwards. We hate our enemies more than we love the Savior. John says in John 14, 31, he says, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Did Jesus go to the cross because it was gonna be fun? Because it was something he looked forward to? Because it was a joy? He says, no, he went to the cross so that the world would know that he loved his Father. He loved the Father more than he desired vengeance against those who were taking his life. So he went to the cross. It says in John 14, 13, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I mean, there's the secret, right? You gotta love him more. You gotta know him better. You gotta get to know Jesus to the point where you really, really do love him. If you love me, you will Keep his commandments. Here's another way to think of it. Think of it as living in the presence of Jesus all the time. Living in his presence all the time. The brother of John Wilkes Booth, some of you, we all know John Wilkes Booth, right? Assassinated President Lincoln. But he had a brother, and they, they, he was an actor. His brother was an actor. His family was all, were all actors. His father had been an actor. But the older brother, Edwin, was a great Shakespearean actor. And one night, Edwin was with a group of actors that he had put together. They were on tour in London. It was a very stormy night. The crowd at the theater was small. Everybody knew it was going to be small. And some of the actors were saying, let's just, let's just cancel the performance tonight. And Edwin said, no, we need, to, we need to go on. And he said, not only do we need to go on, but he said, we need to give the best performance we possibly can. He said, we must perform as if the king himself were in the audience. That's our motivation. Play to the king. 
as though we were there. And so they went on and they did that. And the next day, Booth received a, a note with the royal seal on it. The note came from the King of England, who complimented him on his performance the night before. The king had been there. He chose to come on a rainy, cold, stormy night when he figured the crowd would be small. They had played to the king. Beloved, if ever there was a definition of the Christian life, it's to, it's to do that, it's to be in the presence of Christ all the time. Listen, it doesn't always feel that way, right? On any given day, he seems far removed from our life. Seems absence. Can't, can't feel the Lord, can't seem to touch him. I read, I pray, I don't get anything. Where is he? Well, that, isn't that what faith is about? Faith believes what's real, even though it doesn't seem real at the moment. Do we know that God is with us? I could give you promise after promise, right? But listen to this one from Psalm 121. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. He's always there. He's there when it feels like it and when life is great and you're joyous in his presence and he's there when you can't feel him at all. And that's the time, most of all, when we need to play to the king because that's what it means to follow Jesus. Play to the king. So the cost of being a follower of Christ, deny self, time when we make a momentary once for all decision to denounce our own life take up your cross daily die to self on a daily basis and live to him and follow Jesus play to the king by obeying his commands out of a heart of genuine love and concern for him more than you hate the circumstances you hate the person you hate whatever it is that you don't feel good about. Follow him. Goes against the grain. We're always tempted to dig up the old man and restore him to the throne. See, at the end of the day, it's not really him digging himself up. It's us digging him up. J. Vernon McGee. Actually, Charles Swindoll told this story. It's a little strange, but it's a great, it's a great illustration of what, what we're trying to say here. Swindoll was in a chapel service where he went to school at Dallas Seminary one day and J. Vernon McGee came in to preach and he told this story. Now, I can't tell you whether this story is true. It's about a lady in, the, in, in Louisiana. That's where McGee grew up. And I can tell you, I did a lot of business down in, in Louisiana and it is a little bit different from the rest of the country. So whether this is true or not, I don't know, but it illustrates the point. McGee may well have known somebody like this. He said there was a lady who lived there who had a close relationship with her childhood sweetheart. So in adulthood, they fell in love, they got married, and they didn't have, you know, a perfect life, but in general, they had a fulfilling, satisfying, joyous life together. And so she was very, she was very sad and very devastated when after years of marriage, he was suddenly taken from her side through a heart attack. Here's where it gets a little bizarre. Un un unable to part with him, she had him embalmed. And then she had him set up in a chair. And then she had a hermetically sealed glass case built around him. And then she took that and set it inside of her front door of her little, of her big plantation that she had down there. And then every time she would come in the door, she'd look over there and she'd say, hi, John, how you doing? And then she'd go on about her business, whatever her business happened to be. Made her feel good to have John around. <laughs> Always reminds me of Roy Rogers, you know, he stuffed everything. He stuffed trigger, he stuffed bullet. He said, if, you know, when I die, just stuff me and put me on trigger. Well, this lady actually took it to that extreme. So this went on for day after day and month after month. Well, after a couple of years, she had to take a trip to Europe, get a change of scenery. So she went for a lengthy trip over there it was a delightful trip, but while she was there, she met a fine American gentleman who was also traveling. 
They really hit it off. They fell in love. They eventually got married and honeymooned all over Europe before they finally set out for home. All this time, the woman hadn't said anything about John other than he died. So when the husband, when they arrived home and he swept his wife off her feet and carried her inside the door, there was John. You can imagine his surprise. He looked at her and he said, what's this? Who's this? And she started to explain. You know, she said, well, this is John. He was my old man from, and the guy says, stopped her right there. And he said, listen, he may be your old man, but you now have a new man. And John's going in the grave. And that's where John went, case and all. Well, beloved, that's our Christian is new our condition is new creations in Christ, is it not? We have an old man. We have a new man that Jesus has given us. Many of us, though, are allowing that old man to sit there, to dig himself up and sit there with, in, in the form of all the old habits, old relationships, old pleasures, old ways of life, Things that are not ultimately pleasing to God, some of them may not be wrong, but they're just not what's best. We substitute good for best because the old man says this is where real joy is found. To follow Jesus is to allow him, beloved, to sweep us off our feet and sweep the old man into the grave where he belongs and let him stay there for however enticing the old life may be. Can't hold a candle to a life lived for Christ. Let's not play to the old man, right? Let's play to the king. Let's pray. Lord, this is a great challenge. I mean, a physically dead old man would not be very enticing, but somehow spiritually, uh, that old self, those old habits, those things from our old lifestyle are very enticing. They're very close. They're, they're very immediate. And so we need your help. We understand what you've asked us to do. Pretty clear, really. But you also know that we need your help to do it. So I pray this morning that you'll put it in our hearts to follow you with all of our heart, not with half a heart, and with a partial heart, with all of our heart, to follow you. It's the only way we can have any assurance of salvation, Father. If we're still living in the old habits, if we somehow made a commitment to you and walked out the door and lived just like we ever did before, something's wrong. If we can, if we can do things that are wrong, if we can participate in some of the old pleasures and the old lifestyle and have no compunctions about it, something's wrong would indicate that there's not really been any real faith at all. There's not the commitment that we made wasn't real. And so if there's anyone like that here this morning, Lord, I, would you grip their heart, grab them, pull them toward you. For those of us who belong to you, Lord, give us renewed hope, strength, conviction, desire to love you more than we love all that other stuff, to love you more than we hate the commands that you give sometimes, to obey you. Let it be the joy of our life, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we close our service.